In this episode of This Week in Photo, we're getting the band back together. This is Twitter. Hey folks, welcome back to a very special episode of This Week in Photo. I have the distinct pleasure of having two of the godfathers, the pioneers, the founding fathers of This Week in Photo on the show with me. And there are these two characters here, Mr. Steve Simon and Mr. Ron Brinkman. You guys go way, way, way back in the we annals sure of Twitter, do. right? Yeah. Right Good. back, back when we were the founding fathers. Back when we were having a constant constitutional crisis, right? I mean, <laughs> it's great timing. <laughs> now it's just a constipational crisis, right? So exactly. It's the same result. <laughs> same result. Cool. Well, let's let's start. Let's start here, uh, Ron Brinkman. I want to start with you, man. So, uh, Steve Simon, I'm pub- you, you and I did an interview earlier this week that'll publish very shortly. So all this is going to sort of go out together. Ron Brinkman, you've been flying under the radar. You are in it, and then you went periscope down and then dropped off of the face of the earth. Bring us all up to date. Bring the TWIP audience the back rumors, up to date. The rumors about you, Ron. The rumors, yeah. We'll there's all there's all kinds of rumors people were spreading about you, you know, but I see you're saying... <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I kind of want to just let the the rumors fly then, because that sounds far more interesting than what I'm going to I'm gonna tell you. Uh, yeah, it's it's been, I don't know, it's been a couple of years at least since we talked, right? Something like that. Yeah. And, uh, I don't, I, and, and I, you called me up or you texted me and said, you know, you want to get back on the show. And my first thought was, oh my God, I don't even know when the last time I picked up a real camera was. <laughs> Just kind of, kind of sad. But yeah, I don't know. Life kind of, kind of got in the way. It was, I mean, between getting married and having a kid and I, we actually built a house and, and just all kinds of stuff. It was, uh, my, my photography is a job or a hobby sort of dwindled pretty significantly so I, you know i still try to keep up with what's going on and everything but to, i mean to be totally honest the the bulk of my camera related experience lately has been putting security cameras around the house so <laughs> nice <laughs> nice but, but, but with on that so but bring bring us bring the the the, the po- folks that may not have been following twip way back in the day when you were on your pedigree is you worked at apple you sold a company to apple or got acquired by apple and then you know, you went on and bought an island off of the coast of Madagascar or something like that. <laughs> how did that, how did that all that unfold? The narrative kind of got derailed, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I used to work for, I mean, going all the way back, I used to work in the film industry. So kind of that was my first real, real camera world experience was learning how it all works, shooting movies. And, and this was really back in the day. So a lot of it was still shot on film. Uh, but yeah, then we, we went off, uh, I left the visual effects industry and, and, well, I, I did some software-related visual effects, and that's when Apple acquired us. And then I was at Apple for a number of years working on the, the late, great Aperture software, among yeah. other things. Mm-hmm. Ouch. And, Ouch. That yeah, hurts every time you know, I hear that. Yeah. May she rest yeah. in peace. <laughs> didn't, didn't have a good... Uh, a good ending, much like Game of Thrones, but <laughs> oh god, <laughs> no, it was better, <laughs> <laughs> much better than Game of Thrones. So, but yeah, then I it just kind of bounced around. Um, I, you know, we're doing more technology stuff, but I always kept my my interest in doing photography, and you know, either at least on the hobby side of things, or sometimes on the technology side of things. We were doing some iPhone app development for a while that was kind of photography related. Uh, so yeah, I, you know, in and out of this world, uh, on and off. I love it. You're but I with- imagine Ron with a little girl, she might be the photo subject of your uh, sort of camera these days. Yeah, well, that's true. You know, and, and I mean, I, we always talked about the, the best cameras, the one you have with you. And, I, you know, I, I, even when I travel now, it's like, you know, the iPhone is, is so good. These these camera phones are so good. And uh, it's just it, it takes something specific to bring out, you know, the the. SLRs, the mirrors, whatever, you know, something bigger with an interchangeable lens on it just most of the time. And especially with, you know, you can take panoramas if you want to get a wide angle. You, you know, there's so many things you can do. I just find myself kind of defaulting to the to the phone a lot. Yeah, you you and a couple million other people or billion other people. Steve Simon, what about you, man? For the people that haven't watched that the interview mm-hmm. that you and I did earlier this week, um, 
mainly because I haven't published it yet. But <laughs> the people that haven't watched that, what's been up with you? You've been running around. You you are still waving that the the Nikon black and yellow flag and, yeah, and teaching yeah. people. No, I'm I'm definitely still the passion photographer. Maybe even more passionate than I used to be. I've, I'm keeping that going. But like Ron and like you, Fred, I've got a, a young uh, kid. I've got my my four year old son who. Um, you know, is is definitely demanding in terms of time. So it's made the work part a little more difficult, but it's made life fantastic. And he, you know, like Ron is this a lot of a lot of time the subject of my my photography. But no, I'm still doing what I've always done. I'm I'm doing a lot of teaching, a lot of workshops. I've got my blog going. My book, The Passion of Photographer, has just been revised and remastered, we like to say. So I kind of uh, fixed all the old mistakes and put in some new stuff. So I'm, I'm doing that. And uh, I'm right now I'm in Boston. We're doing a street photography workshop. So I'm really excited about that. I, I haven't been to Boston in a while, but I'm, the weather looks good. And this is a great city, I think, for, for street shooting. So I'm, I'm looking forward, forward to that. Very cool. Yeah, and I have a copy of your book here, hardcover. It's a beautiful book. Congratulations. I like it. I think it's better than the first edition. So anybody who bought the first edition, toss that one and go out and get this one. Right? So, nah, I'll right. update. I'll definitely update. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it is. Awesome. It is beautiful. You, you did a really, in all seriousness, you did a, you did a fantastic job on yeah. it. And the publisher well, did a well, good like job. Well, like what I, I usually like to say, I haven't read it, but it's gotten good reviews. So from that, I would say, yeah, go <laughs> ahead and uh, and get it. But yeah, I was able to kind of. I mean, not a lot. You know, the book was never really a technical book. So a lot of the the information. Sort of remained relevant and I was actually kind of hardened and happy that that was the case but a lot of stuff has changed too and I was able to update uh, things that I've learned in the past I guess six or seven years since the first edition came out and uh, yeah I'm pretty happy I appreciate that I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out that's cool is, it, is there an electronic version of it is it ebook too or in- yeah yeah there well, is what, and- what kind of numbers do you see these days for you know Kindle-ish uh, ebook versions versus actual paper print stuff it's a very good question. You know, the publisher initially told me that, uh, you know, it's still the hardcover, or sorry, the 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 uh, the um, real book or yeah, as opposed to electronic book. The physical book is still sort of what they're it is the bulk of the sales. And I was actually surprised that there wasn't as many. Um, I thought the numbers would have been high. I don't know what the actual numbers are. Um, you know, I've started a Patreon page and I'm creating an audio book because, mm-hmm. you know, when I sold the rights to the publisher and made the deal, I kept the audio uh, rights just for fun. And I thought, well, I'll try and do an audio book. So I'm, I'm basically, you're going to have my annoying voice read the book to you. And I think it sounds strange to have a uh, a photography book in audio it's like watching golf on radio kind of thing um but i think that you know the information in the book will maybe be good to to be heard so we'll see how that goes so um yeah an audio book version of a photography book i think that's awesome i should actually check you know i did a book way back when and then i mean part of the reason why i asked the question was uh because my book's more of a technical kind of almost textbook sort of thing but a lot of a lot of pictures in it but uh I, I certainly have seen a lot of electronic, a lot more electronic downloads. I think partially because it's the kind of thing that, you know, it ends up being a reference book for people and they want to have the easy, easy indexing of it all. But I still sell a fair number of paper copies as well. For, this is for a book that hasn't been updated in seven, eight years probably. So it's kind of interesting to see that at, at the very least, electronic versions of books haven't completely replaced the paper versions of it. But you guys, yeah, you guys think- seen the you've seen the life cycle, right? So it, it was back when the when the iPod the iPad first got released. The whole promise was, that's it. You know, paper books are gone. You know, in in Kindle, right? So the whole mm-hmm. the whole name of Kindle means burning, right? So. You know, Kindle and the iPad and these sorts of digital content consumption devices are going to decimate the, the, the physical book publishing industry. Everyone jumped on with these ebooks. They started publishing low cost ebooks and, you know, and everything in between. But what you guys are, are saying that the physical book industry is still viable, is it? So mm-hmm. has it shifted from, you know, sort of like, you know, email took over as the great way that we communicate with each other but if you hand write a letter and lick a stamp and mail it to someone it has that physical tactile importance to it have have physical books gone in that direction or is it is it is it different 
Steve, you, 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 go ahead, Ron. Go ahead and take it. Well, I, I think that uh, I think a lot of it's going to be dependent on the book and and whether it makes sense or not. I mean, I think people get photography books because they want to look at pictures, and you still, I mean, your screen is pretty, but there's a limited size on it, and hey, it's just not quite the the same experience, right? Like you can't you can't sit on a coffee table for one thing, and I think half the reason I mean, a lot of you know I got tons of photo ish kind of books laying around the house, and they are purely there to to look cool and to spark conversation. If it's all on a Kindle somewhere, you, that just doesn't happen. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like all, all the books that. behind you, all those books on the wall behind you could fit on my phone, right? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. But uh, should yeah. they, right? That's a, that's a perfect, ex- a perfect illustration. You could sit there and one day just walk by and have one of those books ca- catch your eye. You're like, Hey, yeah, I want to go. I want to dive back into that. I remember chapter seven of that one was really good. You can mm-hmm. do that, but you don't really have that, that, tactile tactile experience with a with a digital copy of it would you agree with that or 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 is it two different worlds because i can have all of ron brinkman's book in in my back pocket all your books you know in my back pocket i I still buy paper books i i don't really read on a kindle i I had it for a while and i don't know just a combination of things i just i mean and partially maybe it's just being so old-fashioned that i like obviously having books up on a shelf but, um, you know, I got a few Kindle books and I really don't I have a Kindle that I don't think has been turned on in, in four or five years. So yeah, same here. I don't know. I mean, I am curious. That, just one more thought on sort of the, the, the size issue, you know, because you can get these really large format photo books and it just doesn't compare even putting it up on a on a big screen or something like that. But I am curious as. You know, is there going to be some device or maybe when you put on your virtual reality headset, so you're going to feel more like you can put a photo in front of you that's so huge that it's such a different experience. Maybe that'll change things. I don't know. I think that's something those, the five and four year old kids <laughs> that we made are going to be debating. I don't think we're, we're in the world where that's going to come to fruition. <laughs> Steve yeah. Simon, what, yeah. where, do you, where do you fall on that, man? I mean, the, well, you, I, I think there's, go for it. I was just going to say, I think there's a renaissance of photography books. I think that, you know, the communication of a photograph, I mean, it will communicate on the screen, of course, but if you've made a print, it's just a whole different world. And I'm often just sort of stopped in my tracks when I see a beautiful physical print on the wall. And I remember just how different that communication of that two-dimensional photograph is when you see it in physical form as a print. And even your choice of paper is going to affect how you're going to be you're going to be communicated um, by that physicality of that image. And I think there's a renaissance of photo books in that, you know, as a response maybe to the digital world. I mean, for photographers, it's always been kind of, you know, somewhat of the ultimate uh, encapsulation of a project or a career to see your book kind of uh, forever printed um, in in print form. There's also a kind of permanence there because, you know, digital stuff is here now, but will it be backed up on your, you know, we go CDs, DVDs, zip drives. I mean, you have to maintain that backup. A physical book we know and a physical print is might be the most archival form of digital photography. And, you know, when you look at a book by a photographer, you're looking at not only his or her, her best work, but you're looking at, you know, the painstaking process of creating the best possible uh, enhancement of the image, the printing, the uh, very, very sort of deliberate uh, 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 choosing of the um, sequencing of the book. Yeah. Um, there's so much that goes in. There's so much that can be gleaned and learned from a physical book. And I see, because I love books, as does Ron, obviously, but photography b- books specifically, I'm seeing just all these amazing photography books being produced. It looks like a lot of publishers now, because printing has become um, easier and cheaper to do sort of small editions. So the book as an artifact has become really a good way for a photographer to include that as part of their work. So, yeah, I mean, it's, and, and, you know, it's kind of like, you know, younger people kind of responding to digital by going into film there when there's programs that still have wet dark rooms a lot of really young people are into that because they know digital but this stuff is different it's cool you know the whole lomo crowd all that so um i think that it's not just an age thing i think there's something that happens when you communicate uh, in a printed way with photography maybe 
even with words, that uh, as human beings, um, you know, technology has evolved really quickly, but maybe we haven't uh, ha- ha- we haven't evolved that fast. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to, to see the, the ebbs and flows and how passionate people were about, you know, everything's going digital. Where you going to use the web? Everything is is, you know, moving in that direction. Um, when in reality, like you guys are saying, you know, physical and printed matter is still there. Right. It's still it's still important. And it's also interesting to hear, like, you know, in the has the pendulum swung back to the point where. It is important and the the resistance to things like face or, you know, Facebook or Instagram and just going straight from camera to digital rinse and repeat that cycle is being broken. And now we're seeing, you know, sort of those eddies of physical print start forming again. Ron Brinkman, is that is that like you? I know you've been outside the industry, you know, for some time. But, you know, from from a consumer of media standpoint, is that where your brain is? You know, you, you indicate like reading books. Yeah, of course. It's great, you know, to read physical books. But what about consumption of media? You can consume so much more from a from a digital print or so much or from from a digital media on a screen. You can yeah, get through yeah, more. It's, I mean, it's, it's everybody always talks about how technology doesn't necessarily make stuff go away so much as it just kind of decreases the, the audience for certain things. If there's if there's newer technology that kind of supplants it. So I think you're going to see that. I think there's always going to be people. I mean, it's just like I haven't worn a, a watch in years. Some people still like old style, you know, very high end watches. Some people wear their their Apple watch. Uh, I don't, you know, it just sort of fragmented the industry. And I think the same thing is going to be true for photography. You're going to see more and more places where you can see it. But we're such a visual kind of a society. That there's there's just going to be new ways of showing photos off and Instagram and it's obviously that the, the latest hot thing. But I think, I think it's always going to be people discovering new ways of doing it more than anything else. You know, I'm still looking for the day where I can have an entire wall. That's a video wall and I can just put pictures up on there and have them running constantly. And, you know, hopefully not worry about the electric bill of this thing going forever. But so I, I think it's going to be new stuff coming along. Yeah. What yeah. do you think, Steve? They have made they have made some strides with digital frames. There's a couple of companies that are making really kind of uh, paperly uh, digital uh, image kind of monitors, if you will, that you can change up. Um, and that's one way, kind of like Bill Gates. I imagine I haven't been to his place. Maybe you have, Ron, where he's got all these different, you know, monitors. And you know, if you like a certain kind of art, he can, you know, program that art to be all over the house. But um, the other thing that has changed is that um, in a world that we're so distracted with, maybe this is the still images of time. And I've said this before because a still image, that whole idea of a picture's worth a thousand words, a very strong image in an instant communicates so much. And when we've got so much, so many images out there, those passionate photographers that spend the time to create images that are stronger, everyone has time to look at a strong image and be affected by it. And, you know, advertising knows this and they mm-hmm. use that uh, to their advantage. But, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a world with very short attention span, you know, using still photographs, strong ones, um, is a powerful way to, to communicate. And the last thing I'll say is that, you know, Richard Avedon, if you saw, a, have you ever seen a Richard Avedon print sort of live at a museum? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, he used like eight by 10 camera and his images are huge. I mean, that's the way he wanted to print them for the most part. And when you're sort of confronted by the resolution of an eight by 10 image printed, you know, of a face that's, you know, 10 times as big as it is in real life, it is extremely impactful, much more so than it is on the screen. And on the screen, it's still a strong image that's very impactful. So, you know, I, I think that um, you know, as a as a creator, creative people that are using photography, uh, there's a lot of things that um, we can do now that incorporate some of the more traditional um, ideas and technology uh, in a way that's maybe even more powerful now in a in a digital world. I love it. I love it. Hey guys, so speaking of a digital world, you guys know that. Um, uh, uh, like you mentioned at the beginning there, Steve, uh, Wayne Johns, 
who's a Fuji ambassador, it got his hands on the uh, a new Fuji camera that was just announced today. I think it's a GFX 100, or is that the model number where it's like 15 million Sounds megapixels familiar. or something like that? No, and not I, quite. I 100 in the model name because it's 100 megapixels. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. he's he's actually calling me now. I'm going to try. I'm going to do something never before done on This Week in Photo before. I'm going to try to add him to the call to see if wow. we can. Uh, this is me taking my life into my own hands here. So let's see if I can okay. add him in. I got to find our call here. Be careful. I know. I may bring the whole this house isn't down. Gonna hurt, is it? <laughs> it might. Just, you know, it won't hurt that much. All right. All right here he comes. Bring him in. Right now, we'll see if this works. It's 2 a.m. where he is in London right now. So, wow. yeah, that's that's called dedication. So, mm-hmm. I don't know, Steve, have you, while I, while I, there he is. Wayne, look. <laughs> it's 2 a.m. I'm going to bring you on. I'm going to bring you on with the other guys here. Here we go. There we go. There's Wayne Johns right there. 2 a.m. Is, is this a nightmare, Wayne, or is this reality? I don't know. <laughs> this, this, this is a nightmare of a reality, I'm afraid. <laughs> you love it, man. You love it. Thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Are you sitting it. in a dark room? It looks like... Uh... <laughs> um, I'm in my studio, funny enough. Yeah, very good. There but, you go. Um, you know, you've got, you got to remember it's like... Uh, 2.20 in the morning here. 2.20. 2.20. That's all right, though. You know, it's 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 only 6.18 here in California, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> hey. all, all of you guys got a lovely warm glow, and I've got a kind of an icy blue color. Yeah, very, very cool. <laughs> yeah, kind of corpsey over there. You're looking. So if, if you haven't met Steve Simon uh, on your upper left as you look at the screen, at Steve Simon, uh, the passionate photographer, uh, Ron Brinkman of Twip Lore Gone By. He was one of the founding fathers of This Week in Photo is on the show as we record. And Wayne, cool. Wayne Johns, you guys, as I mentioned, is a uh, he's a commercial and fashion photographer based out of London, correct? Or somewhere what? thereabouts in that area, that general area over there. So he's based over there, does some fantastic work and is also a Fuji ambassador and got his hands on that new Fuji. The Fu- What is it called? The Fuji GFX 100? Yes, absolutely correct. Yeah, the GFX 100. Okay, tell us about it, man. I'm I'm interested to hear if this thing is amazing. Do we want it? Do I want to get that thing? Do I do I care about it? What what's what's magical about that camera? Uh, yes, yes, and yes is the answer to those three. I think <laughs> straight away. <laughs> um, I mean, to, to be honest, Frederick, I, I don't know where to start with this because there's there's so many nice things about it that um, are probably going to please a lot of people and probably please a lot of people that they don't realize it's going to please them yet, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that's what I used to tell girls in high school, but they never... (laughs) 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 Nobody ever did, huh? They never ever believed me. I don't know what the deal was. (laughs) So it's it's, uh, technically, I guess, sort of a medium format, but it's, from what I'm seeing, it's really no bigger than uh, your your standard uh, Nikon or Canon, right now. That that that's a perfect example. Yeah, it's it, it's dimensions. It, it's actual width and its height is actually smaller than um, both a, a Canon One DX Mark II and a Nikon D5. It's wow. only a little bit deeper from front to back in its body in its dimensions, but um, I'm guessing that's just the extension of the EVF because they're giving you a bit of nose clearance on the back of the screen. Nice. Um, but you're only talking a couple of millimeters, um, and it weighs lighter than both of those as well. Yeah, uh, it's mirrorless, right? It's absolutely mirrorless. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Do you have yeah. one? Do you have one handy there that we can look at? Oh, I wish. No, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> the sam- what's the, the What's the price point of that thing before we dive into it? Do, do you know what the, the the price point is good? It's I mean o- over in, the, in 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 the US I think it's ten uh, nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars um, and or there thereabouts and I know in the UK. Um, it's actually coming in the same in pounds, uh, which is a first, I think. Wow. wow. Yeah. Impressive. Get that. I mean, you know, the, 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 the word on the street, and you'll tell us more, Wayne, but I mean, basically, 100 megapixels, and, you know, I'm a fan of megapixels, the more the merrier. Yeah. But the thing about this medium format is, my understanding is it, it, it feels and sort of shoots more like faster kind of traditional mirrorless camera they upped the autofocus and they made it a lot more kind of uh use the usability is really good 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, this thing's got so much packed into it. I mean, you know, starting out in its its sensor, it, it, it's got the same BSI sensor as uh, the the XT3 has. So with 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 a backside illuminated sensor, it means they they can apply a lot more technology to that kind of sensor. So all the all the fun fun things that the XT3's got in it, they can now put into the GFX100 because of that. So um, yeah, the, that sensor in the GFX is four times bigger than the XT3. And who's who's the target market for this? Is it is it uh, you know product studio photographers or just anyone like Steve Simon who wants more more and better megapixels? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be I, th- it's, I think it's going to hit a range of people purely because of the functionality of the camera and the features that it's got in it. Because you know, I mean, let, let's talk about some of its spec for a moment. Um, you know, we've got five axis image stabilization, uh, in body image stabilization built into this thing, which has been specially designed for that system. Um, we've got eye detection, face detection, and autofocus in there, um, which is the same as the XT3. Um, we've got, um, what else have we got? We got new EVFs. They, you know, it's a 3.6 million. Uh, sorry, the sensor's got a 3.76 million dot phase detection system across the whole sensor. Wow. So, you know, we don't have to worry about just contrast detect focus anymore. And uh, as I say, it's across the whole sensor. So you don't even then go back to contrast detect once you get to the edge of your sensor either. Wow. Um, I assume it's not, it's not super fast for, you know, maybe the action sports photographer, but the, other than that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, I mean, the, the the ones I tested were obviously pre-production with only with only beta firmware in there. But um, the the focus in the new GFX is twice as fast as the previous GFX models. Wow, that's great. Mm-hmm. So with the focusing in there now, because you've got autofocus tracking as well, so it's got full autofocus tracking in both stills and video mode. Um, that autofocus tracking um, on that BSI sensor is, is phenomenal. Now, I've, in between me having it and a conversation this afternoon, I know Jan Gonzalez, who was in, uh, in, in Japan for his launch, has uh, said he's just shot it live with a new firmware upgrade in addition to the one I had. And he said the autofocus speed and tracking is almost on par with the X-T3. Wow. So it looks like so this camera is it safe to say that this is now the the flagship camera for Fuji and people that are shooting other camera bodies will start lusting after this one and, and moving over or is this a, a entirely different category and this addition to the overall line? This this is still an addition to the overall line because it because it is the BSI sensor and I mean in in this release of this one you know Fuji Film have changed the shape the ergonomics I mean it's got an in, inbuilt vertical grip um, that takes two batteries um, they didn't do a detachable grip purely because the they had to do it with an inbuilt vertical grip so that it would be able to take the uh, in body image stabilization so. You know, with, with with that in mind and everything else that's got in it, your autofocus speed twice as fast as previous models. Um, you've got autofocus tracking on moving subjects. You've got 4K video at 30p at, at, at 10 bit 422 recorded externally and, and 420 internally across the full sensor. Wow. So and, I think when you take that sensor, that's at that resolution now that's also going to probably apply to a lot of video guys because mm-hmm. you're moving in the realms of the lf sensor sizes in the film world in a video world but what about lenses is this a different set of lenses then is mm. it standard standard gf mount now where, where that opens up to obviously everyone else as well a third party lenses because you know with the ibis built into this thing you can now use third party lenses and old old sort of um, analog glass knowing that you've got five axis image stabilization built into your camera body in the body wow yeah. in the body and that's giving you about five and a half stops of stabilization based on the 63 mil lens obviously it's lens dependent but yeah about five and a half stops i've i, I already know one guy that's shooting handheld at one eighth of a second and it is pin sharp wow. nice yeah 
Steve is Simon, this is a, this is a cage fight, man. You're you're Nikon, right? Yeah. Does this? No, but I, you know, one thing you mentioned, Wayne, is this eye detect sensor, uh, eye detect uh, uh, AF, and you know, Nikon just announced a firmware upgrade for their Z6, Z7, and actually, yeah. I did a little test of my little guy Sawyer, four year old, on my blog, and I got to say, um, this new eye detect, and Nikon has never had this before. Yeah, of it's course. pretty spectacular, and I guess, I mean, I'm a sort of street and travel guy. But you know, when okay. it comes to people, you know, you it it just locks onto their eyes and it works spectacularly well, and it adds absolute brilliant new uh, functionality to the mirrorless cameras. Now, obviously, it's not a medium format, hundred megapixel, but <laughs> fantastic. I mean, it's just so great to see. You know, the camera was really great. You know, before this, and just adding this firmware. Uh, and this new feature to it is a bit of a game changer when it comes to any kind of portrait session. And I guess a lot of the stuff that you would use, Wayne, if that eye detect is working, it just makes sense to to use. I'm, I'm thrilled with it. Um, can't wait to test it out a little bit further. Yeah, right, rightly so. I mean, it's nice to see Nikon coming in into into the game with that because you know they've been a little bit behind, and and I know there's a lot of people out there that have tested it that aren't quite as happy with it yet, and I'm sure Nikon will improve it even more as time goes on. You know, it's it's without a doubt it's where camera companies are going now. Um, yeah, now I know I know the Nikon's I mean, coming, not coming quite from up a, the a vacuum. Fuji, oh, well, sorry. you know, coming from a vacuum, I was just going to say that. Um, it's really impressive. I mean, it did everything yeah. and more than I expected. Now, I've never really compared it to the other cameras, but um, I was. It's just it just works, and that's the bottom yeah. line for professional photographers. As long as it's working, uh, you know, the fact that one is you know arguably a little bit better than the other, and it's their first iteration too. So you know, we'll see yeah. where it goes. Yeah, so, really, I mean, you know, job well done for them on their first uh, their, their first effort. I think they've done a really good job with it and being able to apply that with a firmware upgrade. And, um, yeah, I think manufacturers are now seeing that, you know, mirrorless and firmware upgrades are definitely the way way, way to go forward. Yeah, you know, it's I, I, in a lot of ways it feels to me like that is, is why it feels like most of these traditional manufacturers got behind in terms of understanding – software you know they were still making great sensors they're still making obviously great lenses but i i really feel like there was a disconnect across the board all of these camera manufacturers with not understanding what the world of you know over the air updates and and uh, computational photography and uh, the eye tracking mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff that the, yeah. the phones were ahead of the game on that and it's nice to see that it feels like finally these more traditional cameras are starting to catch up with what your phone has been able to do for two three <laughs> four years now yeah and, yeah and they have to i mean they, they have to do it because for me you know that's part of the reason why i kind of don't pick up my my slr as much is because you know i end up getting better pictures if i need to do something fast i end up getting pictures with the phone just because you know it's it's smarter in a lot of ways and i don't have to think and, you know, and I can hand it up to somebody else and have them do the same thing. So I'm really hoping that it still feels like there's a way to go, quite honestly, with mm. getting these these cameras up to where they're always connected to the network. They can do all these kind of things. I mean, yeah. there's still going to be, you know, offline processing and everything that I think needs to happen at some point. So that's what I, I feel like that as well. I feel like, you know, it's one of the main things that's missing from these these cameras. And I shoot panasonic lumix which you know does a, a million things that i i've never even tried but on this one of the things that seems missing from that camera system is like you just said around bring the the idea of c internet connectivity or even pushing it further the idea of a full robust app store <laughs> for mm -hmm. these these computers that we carry around why can't i have the my my chocolate in my peanut butter right how come i can't have <laughs> cell phone type connectivity inside yep. my my let's say a fuji camera you know, wayne what about what do you think about that is that do you think fuji's going to move in that direction well they are because you've got you've, you've already got wi-fi transfer with the fuji systems and and the g and the gfx and the gfx 100 has that in the system now as well mm -hmm. um but i'm talking uh, app store like full-on like ron's talking about you know i i feel yeah. like i want to try some Cinemagraphs. I'm going to download a Cinemagraph app and play around with that on my camera that has premium well, glass. Heck, you know, heck, yeah, see what you mean. Um, I'm I'm sure it will come. Maybe, maybe not in the top pro end cameras, but you know, maybe maybe in the, uh, the, the the lower the the lower end cameras, and um, maybe that'll come in and they'll trial it. And maybe are you trying to say pro. my Panasonic is a low end camera, <laughs> Wayne Jones? <laughs> 
If it doesn't I see have you baiting me. Megapixels, it's a low end camera. <laughs> what was that, Steve? Simon? What did you say? I say if it doesn't have a hundred megapixels. Oh yeah, so everything's a low end camera now, except for <laughs> the new measure. <laughs> I mean, for me, I you know, I, at some level, I think that these guys could go too far. I don't really think it makes sense necessarily for for a Canon or a Nikon or Fuji, whoever to do like a full on app store. I think they're going to, yeah, there's limited resources with these companies. A lot, most of them aren't that large, but you know, give me a really strong way of communicating between my phone and my camera. I mean, really, really strong. Give me, you know, interfaces that, you know, will, will let me do everything on my camera. Let me get pictures off of my camera fast, easily, no brainer, post it, text it, whatever. I think that's where it's got to go. And and yeah. then, it, it, like apparently they're doing now, the ability to just get over the air updates. I mean, the thing that always made me crazy is I go to a new country and I forget to change my time zone. Mm-hmm. Come on. I mean, how, you know, how, how easy is that to just make sure that you're, you're – camera would connect to something and say, yeah, guess what? I'm in London now. Yeah. Let's change the time zone. <laughs> right, yeah. right. I mean, yeah, Nikon nice. has made little kind of strides with their snap bridge to get your image from the camera for social media to your phone. But it was always a little bit troublesome, clunky, in, not as dependable. It's better now. It's, it's as good as it's ever been. But there's still, as Ron says, it's, it's still a ways to go to make it pretty seamless. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the Fuji X-T3 is now, when, when you get like an X-T3, you can uh, Bluetooth pair that with your phone. So that, And you turn that on and off in your in your camera menu, whether you want it or not. So if you turn that function on as Bluetooth pairing, um, once you open the Fujifilm app or not, as soon as you take a shot, that automatically goes into the photos in your camera because they're nice, Bluetooth nice. paired permanently. Good. Um, so you can turn that off, and even in the new XT30s and things, you can have that as a permanent function, which you decide to choose on or off in both your camera and your phone. But if you do switch it on, every shot you take, if you shoot a 1,000 shots, they've just gone straight into your phone. Yeah. I think it's what it's got to be. I and mean, it's good to hear that because I really, you know, have, having sort of been out of the keeping out of keeping track of what the latest and greatest is, it, it's yeah. good to know that they're, they're at least getting close to where it's not annoying compared to your phone. It's annoying when you forget you've got it on, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Sure, yeah, 100 <laughs> megapixel uh, yeah. photos showing up after a big, yeah, yeah. A big burst of that. stuff, and yeah, I get it. There's gonna be some fine tuning. Yeah. Wayne, Wayne what's, your, what's your daily driver, or your, the phone that you're gonna use on your commercial shoots, or do you have a suite of phones, or sorry, cameras, that you, uh, that you pull out for uh, you know, various shoots? Yeah, I mean, my my main three bodies in my in my kit bag are the XT threes, uh, the GFX fifty S and the GFX fifty R, which I've been shooting a lot lately, um, alongside the S. Yeah, so had had a couple of fifty S bodies and um, sort of chopped one of those in and replaced that with an R because I quite like the rangefinder style, um, and uh, that's my workhorse. Is really two XT threes, one fifty S, one fifty R. I mean, what about what about lens selection? What, what what's your go-to lenses? Well, on the medium format or or on on both systems? Both. Okay. Um, medium format. Let's get the easy one out of the way because that's got the the least lenses. So, uh, sixty-three for me, sixty-three mil, two point eight. The forty-five, two two eight, and the one ten is uh, the f two has got to be my favorite lens out of the GFX series. Jeez. Ooh, and what what are, what are we looking at price wise for those lenses roughly? Oh heck! Uh, with without checking, I don't know because I've had them for some time. Okay. I've had them since launch, so or since they were available after launch. And you you um, mentioned when when you were you, know, you can look that up. We'll put it up later. Mm. Uh, but <laughs> you mentioned when uh, when we were chatting earlier that the um, you had something to do with the development of this new GFX one hundred. What was your input on that? Yeah, that, that's 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 sort of a loose description. So I, I was honoured to be part of the sort of not. I want to call it, say, the feedback crew of photographers globally mm-hmm. on the GFX. So when they when they started doing the initial prototypes, um, the, fir- the first sort of look I got into a working prototype um, was at the Fuji X Summit in Dubai um, a few months ago, a couple of months ago. So then we had a partial working one, but we weren't really allowed to take any shots with it because the firmware was, you know, turn, turning on and off and what uh, wasn't wasn't fully functional. Um, but we we had meetings and we got to put our points across and what we liked, what we disliked, what we want to change and and things like that. And we were hoping to get some changes. But 
And now that it's been released, I'll actually see what has and hasn't been changed. I, I feel that um, Fujifilm probably were already set in their mold for yeah. production yeah. Um, on, on, on the physical structure of the body, which is a shame because there's a couple of bits on there I, I don't like. Um, you got to leave room for version two, right? It's got to leave room for version two, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah, right. <laughs> but there's a lot of things on there I do like. I mean, there's, there's, there's lots of other features that that thing has got, which are just awesome button layout is is all changed you know you've got a top lcd you've got a, a back lcd in the bottom of the grip a secondary sort of sub display which and you can customize both so wow um, as wow. well as your touch screen as well uh, new evf which is you know uh the, the highest rated evf in, in the market currently so so the, the um, camera was announced when yesterday or today the press release uh, uh well it was early hours i think it was 2 2 a.m was it 2 a.m new york time or something oh, okay um but obviously, it was uh, a Fujikin in Japan, yeah. Yeah. Are you? Uh, so, what do you have any idea what availability is, or is it in? Is it in an Amazon cart near you right now? No, you can you can't get it yet. It's not uh, not for public release. This is just public launch, so uh. it's not um, not available. You can pre-order. I mean, I'm sure B and H uh, and all, all those kind of stores that are taking pre-orders already. Um, and once again, you know, as we know, medium formats a, a smaller niche market in the commercial world. But because of its price point, you know, we, we know there's a lot of uh, wealthy amateurs in the world as well. Speaking, um, speaking of wealthy amateurs, uh, <laughs> 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 Ron, Ron, you've been out, you've been out of the game. It's time for you to upgrade. Is this, uh, is this Fuji looking good to you? You know, I, it would be pretty, I, the stuff I have been playing with lately, just for no good reason, I've been doing like some really extreme macro kind of stuff and. So I've been, you know, dialing in uh, like really high resolution stuff that one day I swear I will print and having 100 megapixels would be pretty sweet. You yeah. know, that coupled with a, a nice macro lens. And I mean, I've been doing, you know, kind of stitching together stuff. So less stitching and more uh, more megapixels. Yeah, kind of so, fun. so that that sounds like a definitive yes to me. So, <laughs> yeah. I like Wait, with the, the, with the correct s- answer. spare ten grand I've got, you know, sitting in a shoe somewhere. Yeah, yeah. there is that. There, if yeah. money were no object, yes would be the answer. Yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. The thing is, I, th- I think once people get their hands on it, get their hands on models, that they, they're, they're going to like it more than they ever realized because yeah. it is so quick. I mean, the focus. I mean, we've got phase detection, which is better in low light as well, but it. The whole system is so quick. It'll shoot five frames a second as well for anybody that is brave enough to be, uh, you know, shoot sports at 100 megapixels. At five know. frames a second. That That is just borderline format. magic. I mean, yeah. a lot of data. Yeah. I mean, do they have custom cards? Because obviously you have to have, a, you know, the fastest card available to write that much data that fast, right? But well, that's right. I mean, it, it, it is still using SD card slots, dual SD card slots. Yeah, UHS-2s. Wow. Um, because wow. they're still using the same X4 processor that's in the X-T3. Wow. So, uh, the X processor for four, sorry, yes, in the X-T3. So that, that is pairing with the, the BSI sensor to bring us all those nice little goodies that, that, that the X-T3's got. So Ron, uh, Ron, Ron Brinkman's thinking about it. Steve Simon, uh, no, <laughs> no? <laughs> you're, you're well, sticking I mean, Nikon. I sold, I sold to Nikon a long time ago. Nikon, but, Nikon. Uh, I am hopeful now that the new mirrorless uh, system for Nikon is taken such a is off to such a great start that maybe we'll see. I mean, the 45 megapixels awesome with the Z7, 100 me- megapixels medium format. I mean, who knows? Maybe maybe they'll go there. You know, they probably won't. But uh, I say bring on the megapixels. The more, the merrier. I love those deep files. I mean, even as a street and travel photographer, you know, when you don't quite get close enough and you're able to crop in and have an extremely usable result, it's wonderful. It's not so much about making giant prints. It's about finding pictures within the frame that when you crop them, they're amazing, you know, because of the resolution. So I like that part of it. Love it. Yeah. Love it. So, Wayne, Wayne. Uh, I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about your work uh, and the yes. kind of work that you're going to be shooting with this this new camera. So you're, I, I introduced you as a, a commercial uh, fashion photographer. Was that accurate? And what kind of things are you? What kind of projects are you working on these days? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, I've um, just to finish editing a couple of campaigns at the moment. Um, one involving a lovely uh, convertible Ferrari four eight eight, which is beautiful, wow. and um, uh, a model in latex, may I say? 
Um, <laughs> so we just try to get the we, Wait, both of those things together, uh, or or yeah, separately? oh yes, oh nice. both together. Wow. Um, so uh, we, we've actually done a we've actually filmed a series a, a little series for that as well. So we're just uh, trying to edit the, the film and the video on that and and get all the stills to match to, uh, to to edit as well. We're just trying to get all that done and get all the loose ends tied together on that. Um, got about the three more shoots to edit as well, which I haven't got out yet. And uh, uh, in the middle of planning more live workshops for Fujifilm and Ari, which are projects going forward. Um, some of those might involve the GFX 100 at a later date when they're available because nice. we don't even have them yet either. Um, and carrying on with a couple of campaigns at the moment as well. So, yeah, beauty campaign and uh, editorial campaigns, yeah. You're keeping busy. You're keeping busy over there. And you're doing little... podcasts at, at 2.42 in the morning, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Podca- and, of course, as, as you know, Fred, we got our, we got our podcast show as well, and we've just done, like, two two sort of double double episodes as well, so oh. two two-hour two hour sessions. And we've just filmed one of those as well with uh, um, actually the, M- the MD of Panavision. So yeah, back in the film world. Oh, yeah. very cool! All right. Well, congr- what, before we leave you, what, what's the uh, what's the podcast? What's the name of the podcast? Uh, the podcast is Podlomania. Yeah, Podlomania. All one word. Podlomania. Podlomania. Okay. Yeah, it's a photography and video podcast. So, Love it. Yeah, nice. Love it. Nice. All right, Steve Simon. Before we before we break off, uh, what about you, man? What's what? What do you? Well, first of all, I, I put put Wayne on the hot seat and asked him what was in his camera bag. I want to know what's in your bag as well. What do you, what do you drag around with you during those workshops in Boston? Well, I mean, I'm uh, a Nikon mirrorless guy. I've embraced it. So I have my Z7 as my main camera. I haven't given up my DSLRs. I have my D850 and D5. But, wow. Um, for, my, for my personal work, though, I've been really using this mirrorless camera, and I, I love it. The 24 to 70, it's an F4 lens. It's very small and light, super sharp. And, you know, with that converter, a couple of my old favorite lenses, like the 58 1.4, Great focal length. I use that on the street for street portrait. I like to be close prox- proximity to my subjects for the the intimacy that I get with that, and uh, so that's that's a staple there. And uh, yeah, I keep it simple. I keep it uh, I keep it uh, wide for the most part, so twenty four to seventy range, and uh, you know, trying to trying to pare down a little bit when I'm when I'm on the street. And I can be a lot more stealthy with mirrorless. I love the articulating screen where I can just touch the area of the screen it focuses and shoots i like the silent mode so i can be very quiet although i have to kind of watch out for banding if i'm in artificial light but beyond that even the mechanical shutter when i'm coming from a dslr is super quiet so it's, it's a big kind of switch for a, a long time traditional dslr guy to to get into the mirrorless and you know i i understand you know the fujis i, I know the allure of them but now nikon is is in that game and i'm i'm excited Excited to to use that stuff. But in the in the in the Nikon Nikon world that you're in, you're bouncing back and forth between the the DSLR and the mirrorless camera. Isn't that like like cognitive dissonance there with the weight difference? Well, like because well, the, the big thing. one, I think I think of that. I've I've held one of those a couple of days ago. It just I remember it just feels like Thor's hammer versus yeah, the light enough. one. Yeah. You know. I mean, from a tool perspective, you know, for my personal work, I'm happy to just use the mirrorless. And that's what I'm doing when I'm on the street doing personal stuff. But as a professional, sometimes, you know, I need to be kind of secure about what I'm doing. And, you know, there's no substitute for that D850 and sort of the, the way that it focuses, um, you know, the, the, the variety of different focus modes that you have that the mirrorless camera doesn't have. But as I mentioned, and, and Wayne, uh, you know, referred to that eye detect, you know, now that it's got that eye detect, it's amazing. You know, I'd never yeah. used that before. And now I could really concentrate on connecting with my subject and not have to worry about moving focus points because when it locks onto the eyes, I mean, it's there. So I can just really just concentrate because, you know, previous to that, I wanted to be in single point. I wanted to make sure the eyes were sharp. Now, that's one less thing to worry about because it just really works. So, you know, I could move the composition, the focus stays where it needs to. And that is very liberating to me. And I just started using it, and I'm looking forward to really seeing what it's going to do. Yeah, no, it's really cool. that the, the Lumix cameras I shoot with, my primary camera is a Lumix G9. Um, and I also shoot with a G, uh, GH5 and a GH5S. And those cameras have that near-eye detection so you can say yeah i want you to 
maintain focus on the eye that's nearest to the camera. But mm -hmm. they also have this feature that I've never used yet, and I can't even vouch for it, but that is a feature where it can do the eye detection, but it can also register faces in the camera mm -hmm. and prioritize exposure and focus based on who's in the frame. So if you say, you know, uh, I'm shooting the bride and groom and they're in the crowd, I want to always you know, weight, focus, uh -huh. and exposure on these faces here, it will do that along with the eye detection and all that. So I haven't tried it, but it sounds kind of magical. Does, it, does the, the, the Nikon or the Fuji do that? And I'm putting it out there. Yes. Yeah, that's <gasps> lots of features just put in, yeah. And I think that feature's coming into the 100 as well, just to really get you back up. Oh, <laughs> God, I was trying to slide that in there, just kind of like, you know, mine does this and yours doesn't. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the thing is, you know, for still shooters, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying this is a definite yet, but um, knowing, knowing Fuji, it will probably happen. It's not being confirmed, but there is, there is talk of, you know, future firmware upgrades with uh, Pixel Shift, um, Multishot. Right. Oh, right. oh kind of so like you, what yeah, my camera bigger. does right now, you mean? Oh. Mm, <laughs> yeah, but with 100 megapixels. So, yeah, you end up with a okay. 400 megapixel multi-shot. <laughs> See, now yeah. you got to do that. That's just rude, right? You just got to <laughs> bring that out. You can buy a Hasselblad multi-shot if you want for about $45,000. No. That's fine. <laughs> no. Come on, Wayne. How much is enough? Come on. Come on. <laughs> yeah, <I> know. <laughs> Let's not get greedy. Now you're just bragging there. Right? I definitely right. See, won't be doing multi-shot for fashion, that's for sure. <laughs> and I'm, I'm watching Ron Brakeman's face over there as he searches Amazon and B&H and, and loads up his car. <laughs> Placing his pre-order. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you yeah. got you have three choices. You Panasonic Lumix, you go Nikon. It's the S series, right? On the Nikon? Steve? Uh, Z uh, oh, the Z. F the Z. The reverse S. S the Z. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Being Canadian and maybe you know, Wayne could, uh, you know, understand from the Commonwealth. I think we see Z, do we not? And not yeah. Z. Oh, yeah, yeah, Z. I yeah, forget how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. People are always correcting me here in America. I know. Yeah, we, yeah. we say Nick, Nikon over here and it's a Z, yeah. Nick, yeah, I've been hearing that the entire show. Nikon and Z, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll have a conversation. It's Nikon and Z. Nikon and Z. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. Ron Brinkman, man. So you've got you've got Nikon represented, you've got Panasonic represented, and Fuji represented. Any of these and, cameras? And I'll, I'll go ahead and, and tell you that you know when I do pick up the big camera, it's actually an Olympus. So, oh, Olympus! Ah. There you go, Micro Four Thirds, baby, right there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I made that switch uh, primarily for yeah for the size and you know because most of my photography at least back when i was doing more, more more of it was while i was traveling and you know i had a lot of long trips with a lot of heavy gear you know that i carted around all over the world and the, the lure of having something that weighed half as much was was pretty strong so i went that route and you know for the most part when i do need it it still does does quite well i've got the omd and a couple lenses that i really like and you know I, I guess I hit that point where the trade-off was good for me in terms of the weight, and but like I said, now most of the time it's pulling out the the phone instead. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, I so, mean, you know, of course we we love talking about the gear, but I mean, I think you know you're bringing it back, bringing us back to reality. And the fact is that it really doesn't matter what gear you're using. You're going to sort of bring your artistic and creative sensibilities to it, and be able to get strong images, regard even if you don't have a hundred million megapixels even if you don't have so less <laughs> yeah uh -huh. that sounds like sour grapes but it's okay. <laughs> yeah size doesn't matter right steve i know <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> no, is, I love isn't the um, isn't the new Olymp the newest Olympus? I'm not sure with the Olympus models. I'm not in touch with those anymore. Mm -hmm. But isn't the new Olympus with the with the vertical grip? That's quite a big weighty camera now, isn't it? I've heard people yeah, I think they're about the weight before. So is the yeah. new Panasonic, the new the new S series Panasonic. Those are those are sort of Almost the same saying goodbye to it? the whole mirrorless is light myth. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're the same isn't, isn't size that... as GFX 100, aren't they? Yeah, <laughs> but isn't that that's always been a myth with the mirrorless cameras? I'm going mirrorless. It's going to be so much lighter. But you know, you often see the little mirrorless camera with the giant lens right. on. Right. And overall, yeah. there it's not a huge difference in terms of you know, the platform itself. It's yeah. it's it's better. It's it's lighter, but it's not you know a quarter. Yeah, it's, of the, well, it's I mean, true, compared but... to compared to your Thor's hammer, you know, D850. <laughs> 
you know, yeah. that you summon lightning with, that thing, <laughs> that thing is yeah, huge true. compared to a, you know, a smaller yeah. Olympus, you know? So, yeah. and I did, I mean, I did a, a five day hike, six day hike in, in Patagonia carrying, you know, before my Olympus uh, days when I was carrying around the cannon stuff and, you know, I had a 300 millimeter that was a beast and I, I had two or three other lenses and, you know, yes, the individual lens, if you look at anything in by itself, yeah, it's a little bit lighter, but boy, it adds up whenever you're carting it around on your back mm-hmm. for, for 24 hours a day for a week. Yeah. So that was, for me, that was the decision. Yeah. Hey, hey Wayne, yeah. We, we started this discussion before you joined uh, talking about printing and books and the the sort of the 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 mental difference between looking at content whether it be printed words or photos on a yeah. screen versus seeing them printed you know as physical atoms ink on paper and hung on the wall where do you fall on that you know well so and i'll give you give you two parts of this so the first part we talked yeah. about was ebooks ebooks versus physical books and there yeah. were some there were some opinions on that where do you fall on that is ebook better than a physical book or do you gravitate towards one or the other print book every time Wow. Without hesitation. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. Without hesitation, because I think they don't get me wrong. You know, I, I like looking at other other photographers work on the Internet and especially photographers I know and other pros around the world. Um, but there's just something about the the image in print. There's a, there's a certain depth and a tonality to that. The paper has been printed on the finish. It's got the love, the care and attention, the smell, the feel um, all that nostalgia, and you know, I've got collections of, of photo books on my bookshelves um, at home that um, I, I I just go back to from from some of the greats, Helmut Newton, you know, uh, people like that from from my days who were my inspiration, uh, and that those kind of people. So I I just love that kind of stuff. So yeah, books every single time for both for in for reading printed material as well as consuming photography. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't read so much anymore. It's, uh, I either listen to it while I'm working because I'm working so much yeah. or um, I don't read it at all. Yeah. Audio books <laughs> for the win, right? <laughs> yeah. But I'm, you know, I do have a lot of my own prints and I take a lot of prints to, um, my live demos as well. My live workshops, especially when I do them for Fuji or Ari, I do take, you know, a print tube with about 10, 10 or 12 A2 prints or A1 prints in there so that, you know, it's like people looking at the images on my laptop on a 15-inch screen, but then I turn them around for an A, A1 print and go, well, there you can see it printed. Now you can see how much depth is in that thing, you know, and you can get as close as you want. Um, and it just brings it alive. P- people look at the prints, and they're more blown away with the same image in print than they are with the same image on the screen. So then how does that, and I put this to the group, how does that change the or should it change the perception of um you know photographers that are shooting exclusive exclusively for on online you know they're going to put their portfolio on their website they're going to show the potential clients their work on instagram or facebook etc should those photographers regress or evolve back into print you know and and start going that direction mm-hmm. to differentiate differentiate themselves steve simon what do, what do you think yeah well, I think in the serious photography world, both, you know, I, I imagine Wayne can speak to advertising, but in fine art, I mean, they want to see a print. I mean, you can look at an image on screen and it could look really good, but it just may not um, carry the day in terms of the print. You know, the the just from a perspective of quality, I mean, forgetting about the image itself, it has to be of a certain level that it can be printed, you know, depending on the size of, you know, the particular piece of art and what the artist intent is. But it has to be able to um, to deliver and communicate as a print, whereas, you know, you can compromise and make it look good on the screen and you can't sort of fake it in print. So yeah. it's that's what they want to see. Galleries want to see that. I think, um, you know, that there, there's, it, there's a big difference between sort of a beautifully printed, perfect print uh, from sort of the day-to-day image you see on the screen. So if you're serious about your work and you want to sort of get ahead, particularly in the commercial and art world, I mean, I think you have to be able to show a set of prints. But how do you re- how do you reconcile that? You know, I'm curious. Uh, from you know, the internet is the great democratizer, right? In in terms of reach, in, you know, back in the day when it was there was no internet, then there were only prints that you could make in the dark room. You'd toil over the the print, you'd get it perfect, and 
then only maybe a few people could see it, right? Maybe a, a few dozen, if you were lucky, if you had a gallery show, a few hundred would see that print that you toiled and worked on, unless it hit mainstream and took off that way. Today, you can shoot a photo, Wayne could shoot a photo tonight or, or this morning, he could shoot a photo <laughs> and post it and literally thousands and thousands of people could see it and you know leave feedback on that. So which is better? Or is there is well, it is it a binary choice between this or that? I, I, don't, I think better is the wrong question, right? It's, yeah. it, I mean, we're seeing this across the board with media in general. Is there's just so many people doing it? And there's so much content being generated. It's not. I, I, you can't make a blanket statement that this is a better method for getting recognized or whatever. It's got to be a unique method as much as anything. You've got to bring something new to the table, and that's <laughs> that's kind of going back to what art has always been, right? You have to be the person that pushes the boundaries in some direction to make it unique. And mm -hmm. maybe it's you know maybe it's your delivery method as as much as what you're shooting. You know, how do you get something out there in a way that people haven't seen before? Because you know. I, I mean, every night when we sit down and decide to watch TV, the, the number of choices has gone from, I mean, I remember when I was a kid. Really <laughs> In a my kid, day. You know, <laughs> you, know you, you had, what, four or five uh, channels you could choose from. Yeah, and, and so, obviously, these days, the number of different choices you can make for what you're consuming, be it TV or photography, is just so broad that you have to do something <laughs> to stand out from the crowd. And maybe that's doing podcasts. And maybe that's doing, you know, interesting printing. Maybe that's getting your work shown in some places that nobody has ever thought of before. Um, I think that's just going to be an ongoing process. And it's always going to be, there's going to be something new coming every year, some new technology or method of showing photos or showing your art. And it's kind of up to the artist to be the one that adapts and comes up with something clever or something that will catch people's eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Someone told me once it was, um, I think it was my dad or somebody was, he was talking about that artists in general should be creating, should be using tools to create art, not creating art to satisfy that tool or, you know, using that tool or, you know, creating it's like Panasonic releases a new feature. So let me create art around that feature. You know, it should, yep. it should be the opposite that, Oh, you know, there's a story that I'm trying to tell or some art that I'm trying to do. And, you know, hey, this feature lets me get closer to that end. So, yep, figure out the tool that's, you know, it, it's no different. I mean, art has always been that way. And I mean, how many times has somebody showed a piece of modern art, you know, a Jackson Pollock or something? It's like, yeah, I could do that. You know, yeah. you hear that all the yeah. time, right? People look at something, they say, I could do that. But yeah. you weren't the first one to do it. You know, you weren't the person that said, I'm going to do this and nobody's done it before. And that's the distinction. That's what's different. That's what really makes art. Uh, something special is that yep. sense of I'm doing something that nobody's done before. Yeah, I've, I've had that. I've actually been stood next to one of my pieces before and uh, standing next to a, a person who was viewing it and uh, they, they didn't know who I was visually. <laughs> uh, and they went, yeah, I really like it, you know, but, you know, anyone could have shot that. And he said, I could have shot that. <laughs> I went, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. If I, I had a 100 I, megapixel, yeah. I could shoot that. <laughs> he said, yeah, I could have shot that. And I went, yeah, well, I actually did shoot that. And I said, you know, I hear it all the time. I could have shot that. But I said, but you couldn't have shot that because I said that idea was mine. Right, right. You know, the idea was mine yeah. before anybody anybody can copy a shoot, but the the idea, the concept was my idea. I just recorded that idea with a digital box. You know, yep. Yep. I mean, we know <laughs> that that art is not a democracy, but strong work kind of rises to the top. When you see strong work, I think a lot of people can recognize that. And getting it out there, I mean, the gatekeepers now, you know, their jobs are less important because the internet will sort of find good stuff. But once you're discovered, and then if you want to have a gallery show, for example, um, you have to have examples of those images printed because, you know, they have to be of a certain kind of quality. And it's actually... You know, as, as Wayne said, and I said earlier, I mean, there's a different kind of communication with a beautiful print printed, you know, on whatever the artist thought would be the best sort of paper to communicate this particular image. All that stuff counts when it comes to the, the sort of final kind of piece, and especially if you kind of want to sell it as well. So, yeah, I, mean, I think that's important. Love it. Love it. All right, guys. Well, let's let's wrap this up. Uh, let's let the this, this, this sleepy boy tell us where... Uh, <laughs> Wayne, you're going to bed after this, right? <laughs> is, is, is it that apparent? <laughs> Are you every uh, every time Steve get... starts talking, you start nodding off. I don't know what's going on. 
<laughs> so, it, here I am just warming up. I haven't even got through all the good stuff in the GFX yet. <laughs> I know. That's wait, you, I thought you were done. Tell us what's the rest. I, I'm looking forward to that thing. Uh, do, do you want some more? I want more. I want more. People are thirsty oh, for that wow. thing. Okay, I mean, you know what? Let's I, I, let's do this. Let, I want to let's get you offline and record a, a deep dive into that thing, and then uh, okay. yeah, we'll we'll let this stand as a teaser, and then we'll okay. do we'll take it offline <laughs> and record an in depth Wayne, you know, <laughs> Wayne dive into it. So Wayne Johns, where <laughs> where fine. where can people go to connect with you, see your podcast, and and check your workshops out and all that good stuff? Yeah, well, my my main website is just Wayne WayneJohns dot com. Uh, Instagram is just uh, Wayne Johns underscore photographer, the same as most of my uh, social medias. Uh, YouTube is Wayne Johns underscore photographer as well, and yeah, my photo and video podcast is uh, Podlemania uh, with my my good friend uh, and buddy and co host Jake Hicks. Yeah. Yes, I've heard of him. The guy that hates colored gels. I don't know what he's up with. <laughs> <laughs> the guy that hates daylight. <laughs> yeah, he hates anything that normal, normally colored. Well, cool. Well, thanks for coming on, man. I really appreciate you coming on and staying no up, staying up late or getting up early, whichever it is to, yeah. uh, to come it's on. Like the a show. Daddy daughter day tomorrow, so yeah. Oh yeah, yeah I love it. That's my favorite day of the week. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> cool. And uh, Steve Simon, man, what about you? Where can people go to connect with you? Uh, the passionate photographer.com and from there you can look at my portfolio i have a patreon page and i have a special deal now i'll actually send you a personalized copy of my book anywhere in the world if you subscribe uh at the ten dollar a month uh level so and you can always quit after three months and i'll send you the book and uh yeah all the information's there very cool. All right. And thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. In the middle of your, your workshop, no less, coming to us from your hotel room. That's amazing. Absolutely. It's beautiful here. Boston. Loving it. Bruins are playing tonight. Okay. So you, you pronounce Nikon and Zed correctly, but you can't pronounce Boston correctly. Come on. <laughs> I can't. I got to get, by the end of the week, I'll have that Boston accent. You're right. I got to work on that. Work on it. Work on it. Cool. All right. Ron Brinkman coming to us finally back on the show again. Uh it's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. Do you have any anything you want to you want to direct people to, or are you just undercover and hanging out? You, you, you should have you should have got me on about a week ago because I actually just put all my my really old Canon stuff uh, on eBay, and I was like, I'm just sitting there thinking, boy, I bet I could have got a lot more money if I had advertised to all the people on the show. But... <laughs> you totally could have. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, you could have got uh, GFX money, man. See, <laughs> right? Yep. yep. Um, I, you know, I'm still on Twitter, Ron Brinkman, R O N B R I N K M A N N. Two N's. And that's about the only uh, the only social media presence that I do these days. I haven't haven't even been on Facebook in who knows how. Long, so uh. and you and Donald Trump. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you guys are competing. So similar. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll leave that one right there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I want to thank all you guys for coming on. You guys are fantastic. Uh, we got to get this. This quorum is awesome. We got to get you guys back on together again to do this sort of four four talking head this week in photo episodes. We haven't done these in a long time, and uh, yeah, these are these are fun and very informative to get the quartet of voices going on. <laughs> so, well, cool. All right, guys. Well, yep. thank you, and um, thanks thank to the you. The, yeah, welcome. You're welcome. Thanks to folks Thank that you. tuned in to watch this um, and subscribers to This Week in Photo. Remember, if you want to subscribe to the show, just head over to thisweekinphoto.com slash subscribe and you can subscribe on Android or whatever platform, iOS, Google, wherever wherever great podcasts are found, This Week in Photo is there, obviously. Or you can subscribe to us on YouTube, probably where you're watching this video, and make sure you hit the bell to be notified when we release new episodes or if we go live and do a live stream. And also, finally, if you want to check out the Twip Pro community, head over to twippro.com and you can join in the fray with a bunch of photographers that are just just like you and hang out exchange photos get advice all that good stuff and with that folks it is time to take that lens cap off this is twitter